Thanks, Veronica. Uh, so, hi everyone. Um, I'm Sam DeVries, the Head of Technology from Community Fibre. Um, and this presentation is uh, it's really a story about our IPv6 deployment journey. Um, it talks about how we went from 0% uh, deployment in 2019 to 18 months later, sometimes uh, topping the Atmix stats page chart for the UK for, uh, for our IPv6 deployment density. Um, it talks about how we got there, what we did well and, and what we didn't do quite so well. Um, so firstly, just want to talk about what we wanted to achieve before I introduce the company. So, I mean, obviously we wanted to roll out IPv6 to our customers. That goes without saying we're an IPv6 deployment project, but, um, but critically we, we had to do it without spending any money. There was no budget behind this project. Um, and the, the driver behind the project inside the company um, was actually that we wanted to win an award. Um, <laughs> our uh, our ex-CEO, um, when, when I first joined the company in, in 2019, we just finished as runners up for the um, best consumer ISP of the year award uh, again for uh, I think probably the third year running or something behind Hyperoptic, um, our good friends there. Um, and we've been told that one of the main reasons we we weren't winning uh, that award was due to the fact we didn't have an IPv6 network, which I think is actually quite a good reason to be fair to not win an award. Um, so, so that was it. The CEO demanded a full IPv6 rollout, and that was one of my first projects at the company. Um, but, you know, from a technology standpoint, I was pleased to to get the backing to do that, um, whatever the reasoning behind it. Um, you know, IPv4 is very expensive as, as Veronica's slide showed us. Um, and you know, the, the less money we can spend on IPv4, the more money we can spend putting fiber into the ground. Um, so, so really, you know, it was potentially rolling out IPv6 would be the first step for us towards some form of IPv4 address sharing strategy, which could end up saving us a, a, you know, a bit of money in, in, in the long term. Um, so the full deployment ended up taking us about a year to 18 months and, and we learned a lot, you know, we, we had some horrible bugs, we found some interesting V6 black holes, uh, but we do now have a, a network running 100% uh, IPv6 dual stack, um, which is which is great news. And I don't know if anyone remembers, but when I spoke here last year, I, I talked a bit about MAPT um, and, and yeah, that didn't happen um, and we'll, we'll, we'll dig into, into our pitfalls there. So firstly, to um, introduce the company Community Fibre because I'm sure some of you don't know. Um, you know we're, we're not a not-for-profit or, or anything like that. The, um, the name really stems from the fact that we, uh, that we initially targeted um, social housing flats, um, meaning that we are now, you know, we're proudly resident in much of London social housing and that's really our bread and butter, that's where we build into. Um, but we are starting to, to go beyond that. We're in um, it was starting to go into SDUs and we're also um, going to new builds as well. Um, so we're starting to expand our horizons a bit, which is great. Um, you know, we, we recently, uh, well, back at the start of this year, we announced that we passed 100,000 homes. We're obviously well beyond that now, but I, I can't unfortunately say the exact number. Um, we, we've got a plan with 400 million pounds of backing, uh, which was put in place a couple of months ago to, to pass a million homes by the end of 2022, which is really exciting for us. Um, and a few weeks ago, we... Uh, we did finally win an award. Um, we, we did actually manage to wrap up the best consumer ISP of the year award. So I think our, uh, our ex-CEO will be a happy man. Um, <laughs> um, whether that was due to IPv6, I don't know, but I'd like to think so. Um, and we also got the World Operator of the Year Award with revenues under 500 million, which was very nice. Um, and we've recently announced a three gigabit package, which is the country's first, and we've got five stars in trust by that. Um, so to dig into our design for VP, IPv6. So firstly, you know, the critical part of the design subnetting. So we um, we give out slash 48s to our customers and we've currently got a slash 26 V6 block from RIPE. Um, we, we, we deploy into cabinets, typically anyway, um, and each of our cabinets can, can serve around 4,000 live customers. Um, so we, we, we assign a slash 36 to each cabinet. Um, and we, we extended our block size with RIPE uh, from a 29 to a 28 this year. Um, and that was due to the fact that our network tripled in size um, in terms of customer base and, and in the ground. Um, and we're expecting to do the same again in 2021 in terms of the network expansion. So there might be a, a, a case to go back to RIPE at some stage in the next year or two to expand that block again if we need to. Um, and how, how we've done IPv6 to our customers. So as I said at the start, this had to be a, um, a freebie, um, a zero cost project. Um, so we, we went to uh, open source um, to look for our DA, for a DHCP server to support DHCP v6. Um, and we chose Kia, uh, which is ISC's um, newest uh, DHCP server. And to be honest, I don't think 
looking around i don't think i would have uh, i don't i don't think i need to look any further it, you know it supports everything that we want it's got v4 v6 supports all the transition technologies that that we might want to look at in future like ds light and map t um static assignments forensic logging good redundancy um and i think the you know the isc team because we were a reasonably early adopter of kia were, were really helpful um and flexible in in supporting us and what we were trying to do um which was which was tremendously uh, beneficial to us um, and then I apologize for my awful Visio skills, but um, this is the, uh, the, <laughs> the this is how we've deployed those Kia um, servers. So we've got three servers, one in Telehouse, one in LDA and one in AWS uh, running as a an active standby backup. Um, and they, you know, they share the, uh, the database amongst one another um, and monitor uh, the active to make sure it's working correctly um, and kick over to the backup and, and, and into the standby if, if, if there are any issues. Um, in terms of how we um, uh, push uh, v6 addresses out into the network so each of our cabinets has a, uh, a DHCP v6 relay um, inside it and uh, and that will just look at the the response uh, from the DHCP v6 server take the take the slash 48 and put it into its routing table um, we keep those slash 48s local to that that device and, and just put the slash 36 into the uh, into the BGP table to ensure reachability around the network. So what went wrong? So I thought this uh, this graph from AppNet really beautifully outlined our uh, our IPv6 deployment journey, which was, as you can see, slightly up and down. Uh, and you have to excuse a lot of the waves due to the fact that we're quite a small network. So I think the AppNet stats page kind of struggles with the uh, with the lack of data. But but you can see first of all there were two two fairly chunky issues that we had. Um, actually, the same problem, but um, we'll, we'll get into that shortly. Uh, we then we then kind of paused after a very swift early deployment at about 80 percent for somewhere between nine months to a year um, and, and we'll, we'll drill into that as well and then finally in sort of june july of this year we managed to uh, complete the rollout and get to 100 percent, which I was really really pleased about um, so the first issue um, that you saw uh, the first two uh, circles there on the left uh, were due to uh, kia and um, i guess this is what you get so being an early adopter, you run face first into uh, into the early bugs, um, but but this one was a uh, this one was a HA bug um, that, that that caused all of the servers um, to to kick up to 100% CPU use and, and complete memory exhaustion, and it was due to a problem handling inbound client requests and partner lease updates. Um, to, to be fair to, to the ISC team, it's been fixed for a, you know a good year now. As you can see, this was a, this was a bug that happened in sort of early 2019. Um, uh, this it was fixed in version 1.6. I think we're now in version 1.9. Um, but it but it was a, a a nasty problem for us at first, and paused our deployment for quite a while. And uh, the second window is where we thought we'd applied the patch correctly, and then swiftly found out we hadn't, and then applied it correctly, and then uh, and then the network was uh, was nice and working again. Um, the reason that we were that we were stuck at about eighty percent that you see in the middle there of the graph for so long uh, was due to uh, Huawei. Um, so we, you know, twenty percent of our pops had a BNG inside it, a Huawei router uh, that doesn't or didn't anyway support DHCP v6 relay. Um, we begged and we pleaded with Huawei and got nowhere, um, being a fairly small company, um, and I had no money to refresh equipment. So to be honest, I thought we were stuck at eighty percent for deployed for for a long time until we could maybe you know do an equipment refresh at the end of life. Um, but we got lucky, and I don't know if somebody else pressured them or what happened, but Huawei did eventually release the HTTP v6 support. And if it was <laughs> someone in the audience here, thank you very much for for that for pressurizing them, but. Uh, whatever happened happened and, and yeah so that, that that managed to get us through to 100 percent deployment which was which was really good um well one of the most interesting issues that, that we saw actually upon testing um ipv6 when we first were looking at going live with it uh at, at that time we only had uh, a default route from cogent our transit provider on v6 um just for testing and then the lab we set you know google was our, our dns service tried to browse it failed uh, trace routes showed everything dying at our cogent edge um, and a bit of googling I found, I found this uh, this picture of this quite delicious looking cake online um, and clearly clearly there's a peering issue between cogent and google and, and also possibly still with hurricane electric i'm not sure but it just amazed me that um that there are these types of issues on the ipv6 internet that still today um i thought that was very interesting um and 
you know, we've worked around the problem. We now have uh, PNIs with Google, peer with them in internet exchanges. We've got full tables for my transits, etc. So it's not something we're going to run into anymore. But um, but yeah, it just it just shows that there is still a disparity between the V4 and the V6 internet, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, so out the other side and, and into successful deployment, we now see somewhere around 30% of our traffic running over IPv6. Um, it goes to you know, the expected destinations, your Googles, Facebooks, Akamai, Netflix, those kind of places. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's fairly static as I think Veronica's um, graph at the start showed as well. So what happened with MAP-T? Um, so, so back in 2019, I was, I was quite bullish about the prospect of using MAP-T. I was quite excited about the technology. Um, it, it looked like a really commercially interesting technology. Um, yeah, there's there's no centralized state, um, so yeah, redundancy is is easy. The, the the equipment you need is quite is there's less there's less requirements on it in the core, which makes it cheaper. Um, but unfortunately, we we ran straight into some CPE issues where uh, software wise we could support Map T, but but in terms of forwarding speeds, there were there were bad um, you know, big problems. It was doing software forwarding, not hardware forwarding, and as an FTTH provider, that's obviously a, a big issue for us, being being a, a fast network. So we, we decided to look at DS Lite uh, instead, um, which was which is admittedly CGM based, um, but but at least keeps that kind of idea of treating IPv4 as a service, which was which was interesting. Uh, but again, we had the same problems with forwarding speeds. So I think that was an issue specific to our CPU rather than um, rather than potentially others. I think would support that at line rate, but, but ours didn't. Um, so in the summer of this year, we decided to go with NAT444. Um, and, and, you know, to be fair to it, it, it's worked fine. It's a slightly more complex core network design, but um, but it has worked okay. It's enabled us to, to reduce IPv4 use for our lower T packages, so our 50 meg and our 150 meg package. The, uh, the top two still take an IPv4 address um, as normal. So if you want that, then you can still get it. Um, and, and the IPv6 deployment has, has definitely proved its worth because it's, I think it's really enabled us to have a commercially interesting deployment there because it's, uh, you know, it's taken a load away from our CGN devices and, and meant that we can stretch those further, which makes them pay back quicker. Um, so we're going to have another go at MAPT in 2021. Um, I, my understanding is that there's new CPU coming to the market with the, with wi that supports Wi-Fi 6 that that will uh, be able to forward uh, MAPT traffic at a line rate, but we shall see, I'm making no promises. Um, uh, so in conclusion, um, before, before doing this presentation, I, I read a book about um, presentations uh, and it said to make sure that you always sum up the key takeaways for the audience. And I, I, I just thought the below table was a, was a, a good takeaway for everybody. Um, we were very proud of that. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, that's the end, any, uh, any questions? Oh, it's it's excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Sam. Um, and yeah, the thought of you presenting actually was um, uh, came from that that start that you shared on LinkedIn. I think it was in summary when you had a little bit ding dong with Rich about uh, you, you know <laughs> like getting over Sky, you know, being the top one in the UK, uh, which is great. So while you're talking, there is a raging debate on on the chat about cogent and people having different experience with it. <laughs> yeah, definitely say don't use it. Um, and I don't know if anyone like Andy and Tom and, uh, want to say anything, but uh, then there is a question from Radek, um, if you want to open the chat and have a look at it. Yeah, sure. Um, just trying well, to I, can, I, I can as well read, oh, it, uh, sure. read it out loud. <laughs> hey, uh, Radek speaking. I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you have checked uh, the Lightweight 406 uh, in addition to MAPT and DS Lite as an option. Or if, if that would cause uh, another set of issues uh, with the uh, CPEs? Yeah, I, 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 ha I didn't have a good look at that, I'll be honest, but I've, I know um, I've seen on the nano list, there's quite a lot of interest around Lightweight 4 over 6. I mean, I mean for, for me, it, it, it was kind of the same as DS Lite. It seems to still require that central state, which is what I want to avoid by going with Map to T. Um, but, but I think, it, you know, that if... They're certainly not saying it's not an interesting technology, um, but I don't know a huge amount about it and how it would fit into the network. And I, I haven't found any CPU that supports it, but very interested in hearing if anybody else has. Thanks. I think that the CPU uh, are uh, the most uh, significant issues with, with any of those transitional technologies. So. Yeah, definitely agree with that. I learned that lesson badly this year. <laughs> 
I'm sure you spoke with Rich about what they are using in Italy, right? That sky. Yeah, yeah, they use. I don't, I don't know what CP they're using, but I've, yeah, I've spoken to him about what he's done on there a bit. Yeah. Okay. There's another question there. So, the study said there's no budget, but you clearly spent a lot of time and effort on it. Did you have to buy anything? And how much of your time did you take on turning IPv6? Um, so, um, so we, so we didn't spend any, yeah, any, any, any capex on it. I suppose there was a fair bit of opex from uh, from people time on it, um, and 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 we have, you know, we used we've set up Kia servers, which is obviously a, a bit of investment there as well. Um, I mean, in terms of time spent on it not too much really it's just part and parcel of what we roll out now um there was a bit more time this year to to complete the 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 the, the work to take it across the whole network but it was it was really just just standardizing what we did everywhere else to that to that other 20 percent of sites so we we spent a lot of time maybe three or four months at the start of 2019 uh nailing it down working on kia fixing all the bugs uh testing it in the lab but after that it just became yeah, what we do um, as part of a rollout. So no, no more time than we'd spend on, on IPv4, really. Great. I think what you're saying, it has to become a business as usual, right? It must not be an exception, very special thing. It can be at the beginning, but then it's... Uh, yeah. yeah. But yeah, this is everything. And we said uh, during a roundtable we had in October and April, and we say it all the time, it uh, always requires some effort, right? It requires some, some effort. Yeah. Okay, thanks Excellent. everyone. Excellent. Thank you very much.